So good morning. Um, we will have now the presentation by Kenji Fungi, called Evaluating the Effect of the directi Directivity of Bidirectional Ground Motion on the irre Irregular Buildings, the former Utu City Hall. Thank you very much. So this time I would like to make a presentation entitled Evaluating the Effect of the Directivity of Bidirectional Ground Motion on an Irregular Building, the former Utu City Hall. So let we start from introduction. Okay. The former Uto City Hall, shown in this photo, was severely damaged in 2016 Kumamoto earthquake. The seismic capacity of this building, evaluated in the previous study, was insufficient to withstand the foreshock. However, there remain some problems. One of the problem is that the effect of directivity may not be negligible because the epicentral distance of the foreshock was 15 kilometers, while in the previous study, the effect of directivity was not considered for the seismic capacity evaluation. Oh. Oh. So how to understand the directivity of <laughs> effect of directivity in the nonlinear response? It is difficult it is need to consider the change of the mode shape in nonlinear stage. In this presentation, the nonlinear response of the former Uto City form is analyzed considering various direction of seismic input. Then the nonlinear first model response is calculated for each result. This is done based on the pushover analysis results considering the change of the first model shape. Based on the result, the directivity effect in the local response is compared to the first model response. And then the maximum momentary input energy of the first model response is also discussed for the seismic intensity measurement. So let us move to the building and ground motion data. This figure shows that here, uh, the structural plan and elevation of this building. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. As you see, the structural plan is irregular. This building it consists of two blocks, the office block and the stair block. All the structural walls are in the stair block. There is an elevation of frame B1. This break, uh, building is a five-story building. The present nonlinear analysis uses one of the three dimensional frame structure models constructed in the previous study. So in the study, the seismic input for the nonlinear time history analysis is a recorded acceleration of the foreshock at Knet Station, Uto Station, which is the nearest station of the Uto City Hall. Here show the two horizontal components. Next, we will proceed the nonlinear time history analysis. So, at first, I will explain the analysis cases. Two components that are scaled by the same constant, lambda. In this study, the constant lambda is said to be 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 1.0. To investigate the effect of directivity, 24 cases are considered for the direction of the seismic input. The angle of incidence psi is set from 0 to 345 degrees clockwise from x axis. It should be mentioned that the actual EW axis is approximately 45 degrees counterclockwise from X axis. Therefore, the case psi equals to 315 degree is considered as an actual case in this study. So let me move to the analysis results. What I'm showing to you is a peak interstellar drift at columns in case of psi equals 315 degree in this study, this case is considered as the actual case. Here is a column A1B1, column A3B1, 
and from A3B3. As shown here, the peak response of the flexible side columns are larger than that of column A3B3. Besides, the drift of these columns exceeds 1 over 75 when lambda equals 0 0.9 and 1.0. Next, the distribution of the yielding hinges at frame B1, the flexible side, is shown here. As you see, Three flexible yielding hinges are made at this node in case lambda equals 0 0.9 and 1.0. This is consistent to the actual damage observed after main shock. This analysis result suggests that the former Uto City Hall may have suffered some level of structural damage during the fall shock. Then, I would like to discuss the effect of directivity of the seismic input to the peak local response. What I'm showing to you is the peak response of the three crumbs. As you see, the peak response of crumb A1B1, A3B1 are largest in this direction, while in contrast, the peak response of crumb A3B3 is larger in a different direction. So next, the evaluation of the effect of directivity on the peak drift. First, the properties of the first model response are introduced. The properties of the frame model in the first mode are shown here. The displacement and restoring forces force vectors shown here are determined from the pushover analysis results. The properties of the equivalent single degree of freedom model are shown here. The property equivalent displacement and acceleration and the effective model mass are calculated from the pushover analysis results. From the nonlinear time history analysis results, the nonlinear first model response is calculated according to this flow. First, the pushover analysis is carried out. Next, the first mode vector and effective mass is initialized. The equivalent displacement is calculated based on the assumed properties, then the peak value is found. Next, the first mo mode vector corresponding to the peak value is determined from the pushover analysis. Here, we will check whether the assumed properties are proper. If not, update the properties and going back for the calculation of the equivalent displacement. If it is okay, calculate equivalent acceleration. So I would like to compare the variation of peak response of the crumb and the peak equivalent displacement of the first model response. The peak equivalent displacement of the first model response is larger in this direction. The this corresponds to the variation of column A1B1 and A3B1. This implies that the variation of response of columns at flexible side due to the direction of seismic input may be explained from the, that of the first model response. So next, uh, yeah. so next I would like to discuss the momentary energy input the momentary input energy of the first model response per unit mass is defined by this equation. This is calculated by integrating during the half cycle of the structural response. Then the equivalent velocity of the maximum momentary input energy of the first model response is defined by this equation. So here shows the demonstration of the relation of the momentary input energy and peak displacement. The left figure shows the hysteresis loop of the first model response. Its peak response occurs at this end of half cycle, shown as lead curve. Next, the right figure shows the time history of momentary energy input during a half cycle. When the peak response occurs, the maximum momentary energy input occurs. So finally, 
the equivalent velocity of the maximum momentary input energy is compared to the linear spectrum. These linear V delta E spectra are obtained by rotating horizontal axis, and the response period of the non linear first model response T dash is defined from the time for half cycle of structural response. As you see, most of the plots are within the band of the maximum and minimum linear spectra. Therefore, for the conservative prediction, the maximum V delta E spectrum may be used. So I would like to finalize my presentation. The first, okay. The first conclusion is the angle of instance where the peak drift at flexible side cram is largest is close to that where the peak equivalent displacement of the first mode is the largest. The second conclusion is the equivalent velocity of the maximum momentary input energy of the first model response agrees well with the linear elastic momentary input energy spectrum. So this is end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, does anybody have questions? No, there's no questions. I can ask one. Have you considered the effect of the infills on the, on the building you modeled? Uh, no, on, on the RC, RC members, because okay. because in this building, there is so, some concrete blocks, but um, we cannot make modeling it because of lack of uh, the design drawing. Okay. So, on, so only RC members are considered. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, are there any other questions? I suppose no, then uh, then uh, let let us uh, move to another presenters as we have not not enough time we have some delay in addition let me introduce myself behind me it's opole the city which hosted uh, seven e weeks which is uh, before the one which took place in 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 bucharest i am very glad that i am at least virtually here now with uh, uh, you all so so let's move to the to the next presentation it is performance of reinforced concrete beam column joint with varying hoop reinforcement it will be it is uh, prepared by ashish ugale and surai kante and i hope the the presenter is is ready for uh, for presentation so in this case we we invite the next presenters. It is the, the presentation which was initially scheduled for uh, 15 after 11, dynamic identification and structural behavior of an irregular school building with the authors Azzara Cardinali, Mario De Stefano, Tanganelli and Stefania Vitti. Yes, good morning. Let me just introduce myself. I am a PhD student from the University of Florence and uh, I'm going to present two different contributions that deal with the topics of the conference. Before that I start presenting, let me just spend a few words to thank uh, the Nine Weeks Working Group for this event. I'm happy to present these contributions and uh, I'd like also to, to, to thank especially the organizing committee of this group and all the Professor Rita Bento's group since I am particularly grateful to her and other groups uh, having the pleasure to spend six months during my PhD stay uh, in the Institute of Superior Technical with her, uh, under her supervision with all our group. So it's really a pleasure to be here today and thank you. I'm honored to be part of uh, this uh, workshop. So let me present this. Uh, sorry. Uh, to, okay. It is um, just the first contribution concerning the structural behavior of an irregular building. And this work is aimed at the assessing of the structural performances of a measure building hosting the School of Architecture of the University of Florence. The School of Architecture is nowadays a complex building 
characterized by several uh, several structures. And in, in this case, we are concentrated over a building which, which has a rectangular plan and a regular elevation, but uh, the, it has uh, some irregularity due to the insertions of the strengthening solution that has been done during the years. And uh, furthermore, the building is uh, inside uh, a, an aggregate. So due to these complex factors, uh, we made some approach in order to define the structural behavior of this, you know, of this building, of this case study. In this work, so finally, a dynamic monitoring has been performed. And um, uh, finally, uh, an equivalent some equivalent frame model in a, an equivalent frame model approach has been used in order to cache the dynamic uh, properties of the materials, of the model. So let me present the case study. This is the School of Architecture. It is uh, located in the historical center of the city. And it is an old building erected since the 14th century. During the centuries, um, it has a several, it was used for several purposes. During the 19th century, it has been also the municipal prison. And in the last century, it became uh, the, it finally host the, the School of Architecture. To this aim, uh, lots of intervention were realized and uh, new buildings were built, and uh, the computer organization of the planimetry was redesigned. So during this period, uh, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of new structures uh, have been uh, constructed. Um, nowadays, today, I'm going to concentrate on, over these buildings. This is the entire complex of the School of Architecture. This is the main entrance. And uh, here you can see the two blocks, uh, the same matrix two blocks over the entrance. This block B is a, a rectangular, here you can see the plan, is a rectangular uh, measuring buildings that uh, um, during the, um, here you can see some uh, of the correct characteristics of this building. Despite the regular shape, it evidences an irregular distribution of the stiffness, mostly due to the last recovery interventions to the introduction of the stairways in this part. And um, also it presents, uh, is, is inserted into an aggregate, as you can see from the pictures. So in order to define uh, all the characteristics that, uh, that involve the, this case study, um, we made an active research. And uh, of course, we, we found that were made in the in the last century. So uh, basically then we also performed the larger scan and survey in order to check the, the reliability of the drawings and the thermography campaign in order to confirm the presence of what we, we saw from the documentation present. So uh, here is the plan. The internal pillars as a structures have been reinforced to the injections of epoxy resins and moreover, they have been confined to a layer or reinforced concrete plaster. The Bohemian bolts that they have been, they are present on the upper level of the structure, they have been treated by a second order of epoxy resins. And moreover, in the, in the perimeter walls, new reinforced concrete structures, beams have been introduced in order to confine and reinforce the measures. The slabs have been rebuilt during this period and uh, concerning the openings and the measuring walls that have been confined by steel hoops. So in order to define the structural behavior of the model, a dynamic identification of the, the case study has been performed through the use of six seismometers. You can find some of the details about the instrument uh, that we use. And here you can see the disposition of the instruments. We use the six seismometers al along the two vertical alignments of the structure, along the diag diagonal uh, uh, direction, trying to catch both the behavior of, of the fourth, of the fourth um, axis of the, of, the, um, of the building. So looking uh, at the time domain analysis, the vibration recorded along the horizontal components show an increase in amplitude along the vertical alignment, but it is worth noting that there is an excellent correlation of the waveforms. On the other side, 
while um, um, we can say that the, uh, the components the components in the x direction exhibit a higher amplitude than those along the y direction. And uh, moreover, along the y direction, there is a, a displacement that uh, uh, shows that can, can be some personal effect, since that is not so regular along the, the head. So going to the frequency domain, um, the recorded signals have been analyzed in order to point out the frequencies of the vibration model of the buildings. And uh, we can see how the, the special analysis points out that a complex behavior of the structure. It seems that um, probably the external constraints affect the dynamic response. Uh, here you can see for the different directions, the peak of um, the spectral analysis. Here we can found a, a central peak around 5.2, 5.3 in X direction, while uh, in, X, in Y direction there is some uh, irregularity about uh, the peaks in the, in the two, along the two axes. So in order to, to to redefine the structural behavior of the building, an equivalent frame modeling has been made, and the Tremuri program, which is the commercial version of the Tremuri code, has been used. So, uh, namely, the, the, the equivalent frame modeling discretized the walls into peers, a rigid node, a bilinear constitutive, constitutive law model, current with the Italian prescriptions that have been adopted. And uh, for the concrete elements, for the reinforced concrete elements, it has been considered as beams with a lamp plasticity. And in order to set the boundary conditions of this model, we define, we define two limit conditions. Um, we define the first model, the model number one, which has been considered as free without uh, extending external. Uh, confinement and uh, in a, in a in model number two with um, the external wall that were fixed to the modeling of carriages with an infinity stiffness which avoid the displacement orthogonal to the wall planes. Moreover, concerning the elastic young moduli of the of the of the mensory materials, we adopt two different um, strategies and defining an unpractical condition for the model number one and the bracket one for the model number two. So this is uh, how we work. Concerning the measuring materials, we define four measuring materials that uh, they were um, to starting from two measuring types and then uh, considering the different reinforcements and the strengthening, um, strengthening solution that have been adopted in the last years. So this is, um, this is the, the modeling strategies that we adopted. And in terms of model analysis, uh, we can see that both the models uh, present a good response in terms of model or frequencies. It is worth nothing that so the experimental campaign allows only a few control points of the structure, while the selected model shapes provide detailed information that uh, they cannot be checked uh, with the comparison with the experimental investigation. Nevertheless, uh, we can see that there is uh, small differences along the two direction for the two models. And uh, checking the deformed shapes of the, of, the two bit, of the two structural models, also they present similar behaviors. So uh, we decide to, to perform some nonlinear static analysis in order to to assess the, the capacity of the two structural models and in order to compare them. And uh, here we adopted uh, uh, two different uh, seismic load patterns. And uh, we adopted the ZN2 methods to define the seismic capacity. Uh, for the seismic demand, we, are, we assumed a solid type B and a return period of 712 years for the life safety limit state for the city of Florence. And here you can see the results in terms of capacity curves for the two models. The models uh, 
in blue, dark blue and dark blue are for model number two. The other one in, in, in red, mostly in red are for the model the number one. It is worth nothing that the results are related to the boundary conditions applied to the structure. And um, since, uh, of course, the, pres the presence of the hinges prevent the displacement along the considered direction. And uh, this is look like uh, the more sensitive parameter since uh, uh, the model number two uh, presented the, the cracked configuration about the measuring walls. Then we made a comparison in terms of, of uh, safety index, uh, which has been defined as the ratio between uh, the capacity and the demand. And uh, here we can see that um, in, for the y direction, uh, both the models have a good response due mostly to the insertion of these uh, reinforced concrete walls along this direction. And this was part of the intervention realized in the 80s. While uh, in the x direction, the residual mass is less relevant. And in this case, uh, uh, the analysis is still sensitive to the boundary condition applied, which in a certain way, they are able to sustain the structure again the seismic action. So going to the final remarks of this work, um, we try to define uh, the structural behavior of, um, of the case study, which is uh, um, one of the main buildings of the School of Architecture of Florence, characterized by three-story and a measure building that uh, this building uh, received several interventions during the year that um, Changes his behavior, and in order to to assess it, we perform a dynamic investigation in order to check the model shapes and uh, two different uh, models modeling strategies. We uh, different model strategies in order to try to to define uh, we compare combine the, the the different uncertainties involved in, in the project with the uh, with what we knew about. The model. So about the two different models, uh, finally they have been compared with in terms of nonlinear static analysis and uh, safety indexes. And uh, of course, uh, it uh, as a final remark, we can say that uh, the seismic capacity of the buildings result to be sensitive to the assumed boundary conditions, and uh, especially along the y direction, the safety indexes ranges between a one to five. Uh, Evidence is a large sensitivity to the model to the boundary condition. So, of course, further studies are needed, but the focus on the role of the adjacent buildings uh, and on the dynamic response of the structures to properly model such interaction, and also in order to better define, uh, more specifically define the mechanical characteristics of the materials involved in the analysis. So, thank you for your attention. Okay, are there any questions to this presentation? Uh, Marie Vittori has raised her hands. Okay, hi Vieri. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a question. Um, could you please go to the slide in which you talk about the boundary condition? Because uh, from what I understood, you consider two models, well, three, but uh, two models, one without the uh, boundary condition, and then uh, the second one, which is that one below, considering the uh, the building that you have uh, next to your building. I just didn't understand how did you consider that by modifying? I don't know because I'm not used to the Tremuri to use the Tremuri software. So I just just. Uh, to understand, I just wanted to understand how the software works. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, thank you for your question, Maria Victoria. Basically, we we didn't know uh, which is the the real effect of the adjacent structure mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. the building. So, uh, since in order also to avoid the uh, instability problems in the analysis, we worked uh, defining two different models that they are, they can be. Assumed as the limit conditions of the of the, the the correlation between the building case study and the adjacent buildings. So in the case we consider it free without taking into account 
the, the buildings and the, in the other cases, we defined the model with like, uh, it was fixed in the position where the other buildings are. So we consider, yeah, the carriages have an infinity sequence. So this is um, a limit, uh, of course, is, is a limit approach that uh, has been used in this uh, first, uh, first, uh, for this first analysis. And here, the results are just showing that, uh, yeah, probably we have to focus more about the boundary conditions and their role in the, because we saw that they changed the capacity of the, the structure. Yes, that's, uh, I just wanted to point out uh, that aspect. Because I think that uh, it's an important uh, thing to, uh, that affects you, you, yeah, yeah. you know, the result, uh, the boundary condition affects the uh, performance of the building, and which in, at the end, it's a kind of uh, type of irregularity because each facade will be, uh, will perform uh, differently from, from the other. According course, to the yeah, yeah, of course. The problem is that uh, inside the existing context is we don't know really how which is the mm -hmm. which is the effect of the adjacent buildings, and so yeah, this is a parameter that for sure we have we should investigate more. Uh, also, defining some fixing some point of the of the knowledge, we are able to work on the different parameters that they are remaining uh, uncertain. Okay, thanks. Congrats on your work. Thank you. Okay, okay. if there are not any other questions, can we, uh, we... We have one more question, Professor. One more, okay, very good. On the chat from Madalena Punt. Hello, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. It was very interesting. And uh, I would like just to... to to make a comment regarding you were telling in the end uh, that uh, we would need to to study more the effect of the adjacent buildings as you consider the, them to be fixed and uh, not fixed and i was thinking uh, did you plan to to model uh, parts of the adjacent buildings to consider the interaction or um, you didn't thought that it could be relevant mm -hmm. i don't know just an idea yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a no, no, this is a good idea. Of course, this project is uh, inside uh, uh, a bigger project that involves uh, the, the the analysis of the whole building of the whole uh, the whole uh, structure. So, of course, uh, um, all the, the 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 investigation campaign that we have we used the you know, the ladder scanner survey the demography campaign and all these parts, the archive research has been made all over the, the context, the, the school context. So, of course, we, we are able to try to model uh, the different parts and, uh, and let, let's see how they influence the response, for sure. Okay, very thank interesting. You. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know just if uh, I could go to the to the next presentation since they were one after the other or maybe the other man is. Uh... Um, uh, sorry, Vieri, uh, Ashish Ugal is already here. So okay. now we should go yeah. back to um, the second presentation. Okay, I'm gonna stop. The second presentation is going, the third, um, is going to be presented by Ashis Ugal, as it, and it's entitled Performance of Reinforced Concrete Beam Column Joint with Varying Hoop Reinforcements. Good morning. Uh, very good morning, all of you. Yeah, I'm Ashish uh, Baparoji Ugle, and uh, with my co-author, uh, Dr. Suraj Narendra Khante, I'm going to present uh, the presentation over the performance of concrete beam column joint with varying hoop reinforcement. So before wasting the time, I'm just going to take a deep overview on it. Yes. So these are my contents, uh, paper contents, that is introduction, system development, test program, strength. 
comparison of the prediction of experimental responses then uh, depending on the result yes so starting on the introduction topic in model have irregular configuration and the plan such type of buildings are more susceptible to uh, to the cyclic lateral loads ashish sorry to interrupt but we are having some difficulties hearing you i think your uh, connection is low uh, yeah let me check mm -hmm. Is uh, is it okay? Uh, yes, Hello? but sometimes it stops. Okay, okay. I take care about it. Okay, I start. So in the modern world, what is happening? The many buildings have the irregular configurations in the elevation as well as in the plan. Such type of building are more susceptible to the earthquake forces. In that, beam column joints are most vulnerable to damages. when subjected to cyclic lateral loads so it is necessary to identify the performance of the structure by analyzing the behavior of the joint to withstand these forces to investigate the beam column joint in this study a six storied irregular rc building in the seismic zone 3 in india was analyzed and one of the exterior beam column joint at an intermediate story is considered so here in the given figure we can see the types of exterior joints in which this is this one is the interior this one is the corner here it is a roof interior roof exterior and roof corner so we we are discussing about this exterior joint so many experimental investigations uh, clears many experimental investigation clears that the performance of the frame structures depends not only upon the individual structural elements but also upon the integrity of the joints so in most of the cases joints of irregular frame structure are more critical and subjected to the most critical loading under the seismic conditions beside this beam column joint in seismically susceptible zones are critical regions in the rcc frame structures and it becomes structurally less efficient when subjected to the large lateral loads in the given figure we can clearly see that all the joints are damaged only because of the lateral loads if we talk about the innovation in the joint design then the joint those are capable of the confinement with reduction in the congestion of the reinforcement in the joints are desirable aci 352 2002 recommends additional research on the use of the t headed bar that is using the mechanical anchorage in the design of the beam column joint in the concrete structure in joint for seismic resistance design the horizontal hoop reinforcement plays an important role it is also observed that hoops carry a substantial portion of the joint shear directly with the remainder being carried by the concrete core in the form of the diagonal compression strut in addition the transverse hoop in a joint contribute to the shear resistance of the joints indirectly by conflicting the concrete core thus enhancing its diagonal compressive strength the conflicting views about the function of the transverse result due to improved performance and congestion from the detailing point of view therefore it is necessary to evaluate exact behavior of the beam column joint by studying the parameters such as joint shear strength stiffness displacement ductility and the crack pattern etc hence the objective of this experimental study is to satisfy such structural demands by introducing headed bars and different types of transverse hoops in the joint 
so as to achieve the expected confinement with ease of placement of reinforcement and the concrete from literature study i just want to summarize some of the points <clears throat> from different literature belongs to this experimental study we conclude that the exact evaluation of the energy dissipation capacity is necessary to understand the behavior of a building under the inel inelastic deformations it is also clear that the confinement of the joint helps to improve the joint shear strength number of past investigations has illustrated the utilization of headed bar can be the most conceivable and practicable choices to reduce development length of the bar this helps in accommodating the bar conveniently inside the beam column junction now about the experimental study in the in our system development we use the aci fills out to prerequisite for the minimum area of the joint transverse reinforcement and greatest possible spacing of transverse reinforcement to obtain satisfactory comfort confinement the anchorage capacity of the headed bar is also the great extent owe to the bearing which may require less confinement as compared to the joint with hook bar that is the conventional bars tests were conducted to investigate the part of the joint hook in the shear strength displacement ductility and stiffness of the exterior beam column joint with the headed bar subjected to a reverse cyclic loading as per the section of aci 318 2008 21.7.4 the <clears throat> nominal shear strength is is on the formula which is given this is that is vn equal to 15 of aj under root of f dash c where aj is the effective cross sectional area within a joint in a plane parallel to the plane of reinforcement and f dash c is the characteristic strength of the concrete cylinder the code surveys the nominal shear strength capacity based on the strut mechanism again the design shear force based on the capacity design concept can be estimated using this formula that is vj t minus v column equal to 1.25 in bracket ast fy minus ast fy jd upon lc where t is the tensile force in the beam reinforcement v column is the horizontal column shear 1.25 is the overstrength factor ast is the area of the tension reinforcement of the beam fy is the specified yield strength of the beam lc is the distance between the column inflation points and jd is the internal lever arm of the beam section now moving towards the test program for experimental study we consider six exterior beam column joint designed as per the is456 with variation such as joint shear reinforcement and headed bars the specimens are prepared and tested under the cyclic and the reverse cyclic loading in the laboratory considering the mat material properties while preparing the specimens the concrete mix of m25 grade with medium workability is designed using the portland pozzolana cement of the 53 grade with the medium also with the specific gravity of 2.72 of the grading zone 1 the hysd steel bars of the fe4 450 grade 8 mm in diameter are used as a longitudinal reinforcement in beam and column whereas the f f2 grade 6 mm in diameter are used for the transverse reinforcement these are the six specimen details here j1 is the control specimen using headed bar without any confinement in the joint j11 is the specimen using headed bars with extra single tie in the joint j12 is the specimen using two extra ties in the joint J13 is a specimen using three extra ties in the joint. J14 is the specimen with single extra stirrup in the joint and J15 is the specimen with extra two stirrup in the joint. So these are the six specimen. Then next the another concept is with the headed bar. So in the current research work headed bars are used in place of the conventional reinforcing bars with the necessary development length. 
a bar with the short head so here it is the longitudinal bar with this short head in the form of the welded steel plate at the end of the straight reinforcing bar is provided in the zone of the diagonal compressor in all the specimen minimum clear cover for the headed bar is toys of db where this db is the diameter of the bar <clears throat> so by using the headed bar the development length available is equal to the 160 mm that is 20 times of the depth of uh, diameter of the bar the beam column are provided with stirrups and lateral ties of the 6 mm in diameter here these are the six specimens it, it is the control specimen without any confinement in the joint this is the j11 with one single tie in the joint this is with a two tie this is with three tie this is j14 with one single extra stirrup and here it is a j15 with two extra stirrups in the joint considering this test setup in the laboratory all the six specimens are tested in the laboratory each of the test specimen is subjected to a cyclic cyclic similar to earthquake loading the loaded column ends the loaded column ends are supported with the hinge support at the top and as well as at the bottom so this this schematic representation and this picture clears the idea regarding the experiment experimental uh, uh, test set up in the lab an axial load on the column is applied by using the hydraulic jack at the bottom here the two jacks are used to apply the cyclic and the reverse cyclic load to the beam which is applied at a distance of 50 mm from the tip of that beam and the applied load is measured using this loading cell the experimental test carried out is displacement control hence drift ratio is constant for the cycles of the all the specimens the deflection at the end of the beam or at the tip of the beam is measured with the use of dds so then <clears throat> more generally three types of the failures are observed in the joint that is the joint shear failure beam flexure failure and the beam joint failure or a combination of all during the initial cycles the minor cracks are observed in all the specimens however at higher displacement cycles specimens j1 j2 j13 and j15 shows the vertical flexure pattern fails due to the beam flexure failure failure is recognized by the steady loss of load conveying limit after the formation of the plastic hinge in adjacent beam and same is evident in 4a to 4d beam joint failure is observed in the specimen j1 and j14 so we can that this is the beam joint failure from in the specimen j11 j12 j13 and j15 whereas in specimen j14 the joint failure is same so the formation the crack in the joint area result in the failure of the specimen whereas horizontal cracks is due to the shear and vertical crack is due to the flexure now another <coughs> parameter that is the force drift study the displacement ductility is the ratio of the displacement and the displacement wherein du is the vertical displacement of the beam corresponding to the maximum loading that is the pu and dy is the eld displacement the different strength parameters of the individual specimens are accounted for and shown in this table number 2 where here there are the specimen then load maximum load 
nominal flexural strength which is calculated from the formula number 1 then yielding displacement here it is the joint shear strength then displacement ductility stiffness that is the initial stiffness and the final stiffness specimen j1 displayed lower displacement ductility lower displacement ductility and poor execution as no confining reinforcement is provided in the beam section the addition of the hoop reinforcement improves displacement ductility values as compared to the j1 so it is very clear from this table the specimen j13 exhibit large so specimen specimen j13 exhibit large dis which is which is uh, near about the 56.53% uh, more due to good confinement in the joint region as a result the proper anchorage and an effective joint shear resisting mechanism so this value or the maximum value is only because of the that the uh, specimen j15 shows least improvement on other confined specimens and only having the 8.15% more than the control specimen horizontal hoops that is the ties contributes <coughs> contributes in the compression strut in the direction of the longitudinal beam reinforcement hence confinement due to horizontal ties is more effective as compared to the vertical stirrups then comparison of the prediction of the ex experimental responses the drift ratio is defined as the ratio of deflection of the loading point to the distance between the center line of the column and the loading point in hysteresis curve against the displacement now all the specimen exhibit the satisfactory response up to the drift of 2% and for all this specimen look the same shape of the hysteresis curve indicate energy dissipation accomplished the hysteresis curves of the specimen j11 j12 j13 and j5 are looking wide and stable with higher energy dissipation at each primary loading cycle the specimen j1 and j14 although they failed in the joint exhibit a satisfactory hysteresis response up to drift 2% an improved level of the performance can be executed with the headed bar even without joint hoop reinforcement the corresponding hysteresis curves for the force drift performance for the individual specimen is shown in the following figures so these are the hysteresis curve for specimen j1 this is for j11 this is for j12 j13 this is for j15 j14 and this is for j15 then moving towards the another parameter that is the stiffness <clears throat> it can be found in figure 8 that all the specimen demonstrated having a comparable pattern of the stiffness degradation with the higher displacement cycle it is noticed that the deviation are remarkable for the deviations are remarkable <clears throat> for the uh, huge at the preliminary cycles and then the variation in the stiffness is the stiffness the gradual degree the specimen j1 had specimen j1 had the lowest initial as well as going to non confinement the hoop reinforcement in the other specimen resulted a higher value of the stiffness compared to the control specimen so we can see that here the, the at the bottom which is this graph 
is of the J1, which is without confinement in joint, and other all the specimens are with the confinement. Uh, Mr. Ashish. So this is the J1 two. Yes. Uh, you have to finish soon because your time already passed. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I try to complete. Then the another parameter is the shear strength. The joint shear strength is is calculated from the following formula. And we already uh, studied it. How to calculate the uh, joint shear strength from the uh, table? From the table number two, you can. Uh, it is clear that the value of joint shear strength <coughs> is more in case of the confined specimen as compared to the uh, non confined specimen so for the j12 it is more as compared to this control specimen also when we are using the uh, confinement uh, in the form of the stirrup then also it is increased from one stirrup to two stirrup but in case of the type when we increase it from one type to two type then it is increased but when we increase the two uh, ties in the joint what we look it is decreased so that means it is a limitation that we can conf joint confinement finally we move towards the conclusion that this paper deals with the research on the six exterior beam column joint specimens with the differing in the joint hooks in quality that is the orientation as well as in the quantity to examine the role of joint hooks on the shear strength of exterior beam column joints by utilizing the headed mark and the following conclusions are drawn the major of the joint hooks impact the global response of the beam column joint especially at high elastic cyclic load reversal when shear requirement at the intersection approaches the shear limit of the joint the beam column joint specimen without joint hook reinforcement experiences remarkable dislodging with extensive crack when with the other type study the confinement in the either direction that is horizontal as the vertical enhances extreme load carrying capacity displacement ductility joint shear quality and the stiffness of the specimen however ties are predominantly effective than the stirrups increase in the confinement of the joint by using the ties generally increase the ductility of the joint shear strength initial stiffness however the shear strength increases with increase in the confinement using extra ties up to 2 but it decreases for the further increase in the confinement this limitation of the confinement increase in the confinement of the joint by using stirrups invariably increases the shear strength but reduction observed in ductility and the initial stiffness of the joint confinement of joint using extra single tie stirrup gives equal stiffness at final stage but it is more at the initial stage in case of the horizontal hook so increasing tie resulting in enhancing the shear strength displacement ductility and initial stiffness of the joint the increase in the stirrups for the confinement also increases shear strength but there is reduction in the ductility as well as in the initial stiffness specimen j12 shows overall better performance among all the other specimen that is confinement of the joint using two additional ties enhance the general seismic performance of the joint when compared with the others so these are the some references which are used for this studies okay okay thank you thank you for because thank you the time is going on uh, so uh, I would like only to to stay with the questions asked using the chat system for you for for both of the authors and let's move uh, uh, immediately to the presentation by Vieri Cardinali let me remind you its influence of planning irregularity in the seismic vulnerability assessment of existing uh, unreinforced uh, masonry buildings with reinforced concrete slabs Okay, so you are ready. Yes. So uh, yeah, the problematic is the one I explained in the title. Uh, we have you know, so the objective of this paper is to investigate the role of this regularity in measuring buildings with reinforced concrete slabs. This category of buildings is referred to modern, not historical structures, especially built during the last century. 
and uh, a relevant part, uh, especially of the residential stock of um, Italian and, and European context is that it has been realized to this type of structures. And um, yeah, for sure, probably because of the lack of versatility of these kinds of uh, buildings, um, the regularity is not so pointed out as in the case of a mix of uh, reinforced concrete or steel structures. But as we already saw this morning, there is there are some irregularities that has to be have to be considered. So the case studies are, are settled in Florence, and um, here you can see two different districts that they have been realized uh, in the external parts of, uh, of the city in Italy, and uh, they have been just realized to the use of two different uh, plans. So basically here we have 27 residential buildings that uh, allow the definition of uh, almost 300 apartments. And uh, they have been uh, all realized to the use of these two type of, type of building, type A and type C. As you can see, they are both, they are, the, the, the core of the building is a, a regular block design, and this is a, a complete regular structure where there is a main uh, symmetric axis with uh, two apartments served by a stairway. Then the aggregation of these structures uh, leads to irregular aggregation of uh, and irregular case studies. So in one case, there is a scattered aggregation of two, com of two single cases, of two cells. In the other case, in the test B, there are the aggregation of three different cells. Mm -hmm. So in order to define all the characteristics of these measure buildings, uh, an adequate knowledge campaign has been performed, and uh, it starts with uh, an accurate research and the project acquisition, then the preliminary thermography campaign has, has been adopted and been used. An ambient campaign has been one of selected case for a case study for each ecology. And moreover, also about the measure structures, a flagship test has been performed, the anatomic test on the mortars in order to check the quality of the mortars of the measures. And um, also, some resistant element of the building wall has been extracted from the from the from the building walls in order to test them through crash tests in the laboratory of the university. So, this uh, knowledge allows to define properly the structural structural behavior, the structural elements characterizing the buildings. These buildings are realized through they are composed by three stories. The first two are characterized by building walls, realized two set blocks, while the third level is composed by hollow three blocks. And um, about uh, the box behavior is a guarantee for these buildings, thanks to the presence of a concrete, uh, reinforced concrete ring beam all over the perimeter and over the very walls. And uh, the slabs are uh, reinforced concrete slabs at the upper the lower floors, while at the upper level, there is um, uh, a slab that is uh, realized to uh, reinforce the concrete to fabricated joist, that is the, uh, the so-called Varese joist, connected with hollow flat tiles. Here you can see a section uh, with uh, all the constructive details of the, of the buildings. And here the main um, mechanical characteristics that we used for the seismic analysis. So basically, the clay bricks, the clay bricks have been just used for the definition of the terraces in type A. In order to assess the, uh, the regular uh, plan of this type of buildings, we defined, uh, we, we we approach the, the seismic analysis, uh, the, the studying three different buildings for each typology. The single unit A, which is the single unit, which is the regular one. Then the Dublin and the, right, the triple configuration of the two types. And finally, the, the final types, they are the original ones with the scattered position along the Y direction. This has been made for the, both the two typologies. And uh, so um, the, we, have, we have adopted approach to the seismic modeling through an equivalent frame modeling. It has been made through the software Tremuri, 
and uh, here always they discretize the measure to peer standards and rigid nodes. For the measure elements in this work, we adopted a multilinear constitutive law with a strength decay. And um, so here, here you can find some references. And uh, in terms of that, we have used these models in order to perform nonlinear statics analysis. Um, for the different models, here you can find uh, the pushover curves plotted uh, weighting the base shear and the displacement over the weight of the, the structure and the height of the buildings. Uh, basically, we can see some different uh, performances of the structure. In fact, uh, here you can see that the case, the single case, single cell, the single unit has both a, a lower stiffness and a lower base shear capacity. And uh, while uh, for the other two cases, uh, the, the case, the double unit A has a, a higher capacity, while the type A presents uh, almost the same, but uh, with a, uh, a strength decay that happens before. This is um, more or less the same with true with the inverse triangular pattern, while uh, in in, a, in y direction there is some differences, and um, this is mostly done by the fact that the resist this resistance wall uh, in y direction is in the case of double unit is shared between the two units, so it leads to a lower lower capacity that is that one that is pointed out for example with the, the inverse triangular pattern, while for um, uh, the type A finally has uh, some resistance wall that is uh, longer in the case of the final configuration. And um, this is uh, more evident of, for sure for the case uh, uh, B, which uh, is compound by three different uh, units. And uh, this is uh, here you can see the capacity of the triple unit B in next direction that is. Uh, way bigger than the one of the single case because of the resistance walls along the direction. And finally, the, the capacity of the final type B, which is in, in an intermediate position between the two. Also in the, in the Y direction, the presence of the, the resistance walls that they are increased along the Y direction is uh, evidence is pointed out by this uh, shear by the stiffness capacity that is higher for this model and also for this base shear. Nevertheless, the strength, de strength decay of this model, of the final model, is uh, bigger than for these two others. In terms of, uh, so aiming to, the, to assess the two combinations of the cell unit, they have been uh, compared uh, in terms of big ground acceleration for the each uh, limit state of the, the, on the pushover curves. And um, uh, with respect to the single case study. So here, the, first of all, we define the, the performance levels, and then uh, through a multi-scale multi, uh, approach, then uh, we use the capacity spectrum method in order to define the PG, the big ground acceleration for the attainment of each uh, damage limit state. And so finally, we compare the one of the two combinations compared to the one of the single case. So here we can see the results in X, in X and Y direction uh, that mostly represent the same results that uh, we had for the shower curves. Basically, for in X direction, both the type double and type A have an increase of the PGA levels, which is done by the presence of more resistant area towards the direction. And um, this is, this is uh, clear also for the type B. And instead, for the, the Y direction, there is a reduction of uh, the capacity, especially, especially for the type uh, A, where, uh, yeah, also for type A, there is some decrease of, uh, of the peak ground acceleration values. And, but the double, the double case is always the lowest. And in case of the, the type B, instead, uh, there is uh, some, uh, some differentiation between the, the type triple element and the type B, which is still done by the presence of the resistance walls. 
in order to, to assess also the torsional electrics in top displacement of the buildings, we, we select the control nodes of, on top of the buildings and they have been compared to the one of the lateral, to the displacement of the lateral walls. And we can see, we can see how the benchmark especially has a torsional deformable, deformable behavior and uh, the differences uh, between the perimetral nodes and the selected control points are below the 4% of the referred displacement. While for the final case A is type B, there is some torsional effect, torsional rigid effect. And uh, by the way, this is for, this happens is uh, more clear mostly for the damage level four, where a maximum difference of 5.6, sorry, here occurred. So uh, finally, we aim also to also to compare the damage pattern of the, of the measure structures um, towards the same direction. So in this case, we compare the, the damage pattern of the wall number one for uh, in y direction for the, for the seismic action with the, the final wall number one of the type to be. Here you can see the pushover curves of the single unit V with the different damage levels. And here the capacity of the two walls and uh, here the damage patterns, they both show that uh, for the attain, that the, there is a, a faster decrease of the capacity of the wall for type B. And this is also pointed out by the damage pattern where pointing out, uh, setting the same displacement, we can see that uh, while uh, here, um, also the, we have in the type B, we already had a, a shear failure of the ground floor. Uh, there is still some capacity in for the case of the, this wall. So yeah, of course we are we are already with a shear, shear damage, a heavy shear damage, but uh, there is still some capacity. And so this is pointed out also by the curves. So going to the conclusion of this presentation, um, we in order to assess the influence of the plane irregularity of measuring buildings with reinforced concrete slabs. Uh, we, um, we took two projects that have been adopted in Florence in order to realize uh, 27 different buildings. And then we used an equipment frame discretizations in order to perform a linear and static analysis. And um, the comparisons have been made through the different models adopting in terms of pushover curves, performance points, and um, then we try to check also the torsional effects that have been assessed through the analysis of the distribution on top displacement. So uh, there is, of course, uh, some different uh, some differences uh, in case of the, uh, for the between the regular cases and the final buildings. Uh, generally, the increase of the res resistance walls leads to higher values of peak ground acceleration. And uh, looking at the, this kind of buildings, some torsional phenomena also occurs, especially for the highest damage levels. Uh, by the way, it is possible to assume that the structure has a uniform behavior, of course. And uh, then, moreover, the torsional shapes are limited, as we saw. So further analysis are for sure expected uh, concerning depth studies, uh, taking into account the role of the Empiricity in the application of the dot patterns recommended, together with the use of other nonlinear static procedures, considering high mode effects, and also nonlinear dynamic analysis in order to check the reliability of the nonlinear static procedure adopted in this research that I presented. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Any questions? I don't think so. So I would suggest we are a bit behind schedule. So maybe we should take a five minutes break instead of the 15 that was already planned. And uh, we will see you in five minutes. Is that okay? Okay. For me, it's okay. So <laughs> 12, 10, 25. Okay. Thank you.